Mr. President, our Democratic colleagues in the House and to some extent here in the Senate have talked about how the so-called Build Back Better legislation is popular. But I think the main reason it's popular is because, frankly, many members of Congress and certainly the public at large don't know what's in it. And so I'd like to spend just a few minutes talking about that. First of, first of all, there's the size of the bill. Originally, the Budget Committee Chairman, uh, the Senator from Vermont, floated a $6 trillion spending bonanza. This, of course, is on top of about $5 trillion that we spent last year in a bipartisan fashion dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. But of course, this wasn't designed, this $6 trillion more was designed to be passed um, with the pure party line vote through the reconciliation process. After some pushback, the $6 trillion figure that Chairman Sanders proposed, it was cut back to 3.5, and now our colleagues in the House and elsewhere are touting a new pared down bill which spends only, and I underline the word only, $1.75 trillion. I dare say that's a number none of us can fully comprehend given its magnitude, but it's become sort of rolls off our tongue like everybody understands what a trillion dollars is, like everybody knows what a million is, or a thousand, or a hundred, or ten dollars, but it is an enormous number. As our colleagues have slimmed and trimmed this bill to reach a price tag that could get consensus in the House, some of their favorite provisions have fallen off the chopping block. They realize that programs like free college actually cost a whole lot of money. And so to live within this new number, which I'll talk about in a moment, um, Democrats in the House uh, kept cutting and cutting but they found, instead of real cuts, they found another solution to their problem of a top line. What they basically have done is to create the illusion of a lower price tag without making any real substantive long-term cuts. And how do you do that? Well, it's the old-fashioned way. It's called budget gimmicks. Rather than remove these expensive programs entirely, they chose to to create a number of arbitrary cliffs, sunset, sunsets, and expirations. That way they could pretend to pass these bills at a lower cost with the tacit promise to continue them at another time and another day. One example of this was the expanded child tax credit. Our Democratic colleagues originally crafted this as a temporary measure in their partisan bill that became law in March, just eight months ago. The first payments, though, had barely gone out the door when they decided to call for making those temporary provisions permanent in the BBB, so-called Build Back Better bill. Our colleagues knew that a permanent extension and expansion would have been far too expensive to meet their top line, so they pretended to cut it by making it a temporary extension. Earlier drafts of this bill would have extended this policy through 2025. As time went on, the price tag was still too high, so it was scaled back to a one-year extension. But the truth is nothing has really changed. Calls to make the expansion permanent have not gone away. I've seen no indication our colleagues across the aisle are content to let this extension expire after just one year. The same is true of the earned income tax credit, which also was expanded in March. A number of our colleagues have spoken here on the Senate floor about the need to make this expansion of the earned income tax credit permanent. But the not so temporary extensions don't end there. This bill extends the Affordable Care Act premium tax credits through 2025, which our colleagues claim will enable more Americans to afford health care coverage. But at the same time, this bill cuts funding to safety net hospitals in states that did not expand Medicaid. If their goal was to expand access to low-income individuals under the Medicaid program, their bill cuts that funding to safety net hospitals in states like mine that did not expand Medicaid. 
And these cuts specifically target hospitals that treat underinsured and uninsured patients. In short, our colleagues are manipulating the budget process in a way that appears to extend access to health care while at the same time cuts funding to our most vulnerable patients, all in the cause of pushing America closer to a single payer system, something like Medicare for all. I have no doubt that our colleagues across the aisle uh, will, if possible, not let these temporary provisions expire. In the immortal words of Ronald Reagan, though, the closest thing to eternal life on Earth is a temporary government program. We've seen this movie before, time and time again. It's, uh, it's smoke and mirrors, it's budget gimmickry, it's starting new programs, um, claiming to cut them off after a year, knowing that inevitably Congress will be tempted to extend them much, much longer. Well, before this bill comes to a vote in the Senate, I hope our Democratic colleagues will agree with me. We need to know precisely how much this bill will cost the American people. We know that our colleagues across the aisle have struggled to try to make a $6 trillion bill appear to be a $3.5 trillion and now a $1.75 trillion bill, but I don't think anybody's really fooled or confused. Because they've strategically chosen start dates, sunsets, and expiration dates to make it appear that these programs cost less, we know that eventually, if they have the votes, they will be extended through eternity. And our colleagues game the tax code to partially fund the bill while handing out massive tax breaks to millionaires and billionaires. And I'm glad to see the chairman of the Budget Committee say that we really shouldn't be focused on tax cuts to millionaires and billionaires in blue states and cities like New York or San Francisco, which is exactly what the Democratic bill tries to provide. Tax cuts to millionaires and billionaires in blue states. This bill is really chock full of inconsistencies, claiming to extend access to health care while cutting off access to Medicaid for some of the safety net programs in states like mine, claiming that, well, we're going to tax the, the rich folks while at the same time providing tax cuts to millionaires and billionaires in blue states by lifting or eliminating the SALT deduction, the state and local tax deduction, which allows taxpayers, these millionaires and billionaires in, in blue states to deduct their state and local taxes which means not only do they get a tax cut, but the rest of us end up subsidizing them because in order to get the revenue needed, that means regular working folks are going to have to pick up, pick up the gap. The best evidence of this maneuvering is the fact there's not a single year over the next decade in which each tax provision would be used at the same time. Let me say that again. Of all the gaming in the tax code, the fact is, under the proposal by the House of Representatives that we at some point will consider here, the fact is there is not a single year over the next decade in which each of these tax provisions would be used at the same time. This is nothing but gimmicks and sleight of hand accounting. In my previous life, Mr. President, I was uh, Attorney General of Texas. We had something called the Consumer Protection Division. If anybody in the private sector would falsely advertise like the federal government and Congress is trying to do in this so-called Build Back Better bill, we would go after them with a vengeance for defrauding consumers. Unfortunately, that doesn't apply to Congress. I wish it did. But we often talk, at least at intermittently about needing to know what's in a bill before we actually vote on it. At one time or another, senators on both sides of the aisle have griped about voting on thousand-page bills that were completed just hours before the vote. Knowing the true cost of these, this legislation is no different. Before voting on it, 
we have the duty to understand how it will impact our debt and deficits and how big of a bill the American people will be stuck with. And there's also this ugly animal rearing its head called inflation. 70%, I think, in a recent public opinion poll I've seen of the public say that inflation is eating away more and more of their income and actually reducing their standard of living. It's a silent tax on working families. And I would think that if we're concerned about the welfare of those families, that we ought to be very concerned about making inflation worse by pouring more and more money into our economy, chasing fewer and fewer goods and services. That's part of the problem now. There's so much money sloshing around as a result of the spending by Congress, much of it associated with COVID-19, but not all of it. Some of it with the American Recovery Act that was passed, the $1.9 trillion in the early days of the Biden administration. But the truth is inflation is eating our lunch and we should not be making it worse by spending a lot more money as our Democratic colleagues are proposing we do in the Build Back Better bill. So we need a cost estimate by the Congressional Budget Office, the official score of these spending bills, because we know that what we've seen so far is full of gimmicks, tricks, phony cliffs, phony expiration dates, as I've said, and basically misleading the public and Congress into knowing what exactly is in this bill and how much it will cost. Well, the cost estimate provided by the CBO, we know, given these phony assumptions, is not an accurate statement of the true cost of the bill. This isn't a reflection on the folks that work at the CBO, but the scoring rules they must follow. So despite the fact that our Democratic colleagues have explicitly said that temporary programs will be extended at the first opportunity beyond the terms laid out in the bill, the Congressional Budget Office has to play along and act like that's true. But we know it's not true. Fortunately, there are groups on the outside that have conducted their own analysis, assuming that all these phony cliffs and expiration dates and one-year creation of programs that will later be extended, they don't have to buy this uh, sort of smoke and mirrors approach to the budget. These groups have conducted their own analysis and have told us what they think the true cost of this $1.75 trillion bill, so-called, that passed the House, what it will be. For example, the budget experts at the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School of Business have analyzed this legislation as if these temporary provisions would be made permanent, which I think is, is the safest assumption to make. So instead of $1.75 trillion, they pegged the cost close to $4.6 trillion over 10 years, more than two and a half times the amount Democrats have claimed. Then there's the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget that thinks that the number could even be a few hundred billion higher than that. They estimate the true cost of this bill, now claimed to be $1.75 trillion, to be approximately $5 trillion. This is a massive, massive jump from what Democrats have said the cost of this bill will be. Even one of our colleagues on the other side of the aisle has acknowledged that this is disingenuous, and I would just use the word false, advertising. The true cost of this legislation is much closer to Chairman Sanders' original $6 trillion request than the scaled back, so-called scaled back proposal of the current bill. Before this legislation comes to the Senate floor, we need to see a true cost estimate based on reasonable assumptions, not a fairy tale scenario. It defies all common sense to vote on a bill without knowing how much it's going to cost ahead of time. To this end, last week I sent a letter to the leaders of the Congressional Budget Office and the Joint Committee on Taxation requesting an updated estimate based on more reasonable assumptions. If the temporary provisions of this bill are extended, and I fully expect 
expect them to be if our Democratic colleagues have the votes to do it. This legislation will cost a whole lot more than what the American people have been told. And we need to know as close as we can exactly how much that will be. Well, it's obvious what's going on here. These not so temporary provisions won't expire in a year or four years or 10 years. We need to operate under rational assumptions that our Democratic colleagues, when the chance is provided to them, will make these programs permanent and to come up with a true and honest score for the bill. If this legislation is all of a sound investment as our Democratic colleagues claim, they shouldn't have anything to be afraid of. And we do have a duty, I believe, as members of Congress, voting on legislation of this magnitude to know what we're doing before we're asked to vote on it. I don't think anybody who really uh, should have anything to be afraid of unless they're afraid of a true accounting as opposed to the smoke and mirrors we see so far on this phony gimmickry bill. Mr. President, I yield the floor.